Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can help out by clicking the like or subscribe button. You can also donate using the Patreon link in the description below. So I'm glad to be back and I've got a great show for everybody today. We're going to touch on three or so companies today and they all gave updates in their clinical pipeline. So we're going to touch on all of it. And I got to be honest with you, they're not the most positive updates, but you know, this is the tough part about investing. We got to deal with setbacks. So we're going to talk today about Cyclerion, Adverum, as well as Trillium. And the big one today is going to be Trillium because they had their R&D day last week where they gave a lot of updates in terms of their clinical pipeline and their, their future progress. So that's going to be our main story for today. So with that, let's just get right into it. And the first company I want to touch on is called Cyclerion, ticker symbol CYCN, and they're trading now at a market cap of only $83 million. And what they are doing is trying to develop a clinical molecule to promote cyclic GMP signaling. And they're doing this in indications surrounding neurodegenerative diseases. The lead molecule is called CY6463, and it has a role in stimulating this nitric oxide cyclic GMP pathway. They had some upsets in the latter half of last year when I took an original position, and they were trying to look at a different molecule but a similar pathway in sickle cell disease, but they did see a little bit of positive data in their early uh, cognitive studies. So what they decided to do is to take this one molecule and move it forward in Alzheimer's disease with vascular pathology, as well as this rare disease called MELAS. Now, MELAS is kind of a complicated disease that I don't know too much about, but one thing that is for sure is that it's a cognitive function disease as well. So what Cyclerion proposed is that they would do a small study in this rare disease called MELAS to use as a proof of concept to show that CY6463 has some kind of benefit to patients that have a, a cognitive symptom in their disease. The reason why the stock dropped so much on the news after this clinical update is that the phase 2a study that was supposed to come out for MELAS in mid-2021 was going to be delayed to the end of 2021 due to COVID. So we have to wait about six months or so before we see the data there. And as we know with biotechs, they are constantly burning money every quarter. And a delay like this also hurts the confidence that we have in the company. So. The study itself is only a 29-day study, and they're only doing up to 20 adults. So I think for that reason as well, it doesn't hold a lot of confidence that they have to push the study by six months. Um, it is an open-label study, so we also don't have a placebo group, which makes the bar just so much lower. And the company is paying for it. They are only trading at around an $83 million market cap, so I'm hoping that the bottom is in. The company is moving forward with looking into Alzheimer's disease with vascular pathology, and this is an interesting one because I think the vascular pathology part of the cyclic GMP and nitric oxide pathway has been validated in other systems, even though Cyclerion wasn't able to see a benefit in their sickle cell disease trial. All of that set aside, I think it will be interesting to see what this readout is going to provide. Now, it's a phase 2A study expected to initiate in mid-2021. It's only a 12-week study, and they're looking to enroll only 30 patients, and it's placebo controlled, so we can expect that the data quality here is going to be a bit higher than the MELAS study. Now, given the fact that it's only 12 weeks and it's only 30 participants, I, I'm nervous that the data that we see here is not going to be statistically significant. But as we saw with other studies that have done similar things in Alzheimer's disease, the bar is just so low for companies to show some kind of positive effect, at least in earlier phase trials, that leads to this massive increase in their stock price once they give the press release. So I think it's definitely worth playing this catalyst when we get closer to the data readout. And that might not happen until either the end of 2021 or maybe early 2022. But I think the one readout that we can expect is that MELAS by the end of 2021. The company did announce that they're looking into another indication called cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia, or CIAS. And what they're doing is initiating a phase 1b study, and they didn't give us too much of a timeline on when that's going to start. There is no clinicaltrials.gov page, so it makes it hard for us to track that. And it's a 14-day study in 50 patients across four cohorts. And this study will be double-blind and placebo-controlled. So when they get around to doing that, there's definitely going to be some interest there. But in the short term, I think MELAS is really the outcome that we're looking for. And because the stock is trading so low right now, I think the upside is huge for the company, 
Obviously, we have to wait around six months or so, so it's going to take some time. The company also mentioned that they're doing IND enabling studies for a better kind of cyclic GMP signaling molecule called CY3018. So we'll see what that leads to. But for me right now, I'm going to hold on for another six months or so, and we'll see what the company can deliver by the end of this year. So with that, I want to move on to Adverum, ticker symbol ADVM. And they are now trading at a $380 million market cap, and that's a huge decrease from around a billion dollars. They're trading at $10 a share, and that went down to around four, and I think now they're trading in the threes or so. And this drop was based on the announcement that a suspected, unexpected, serious adverse event of hypotony, which is clinically relevant decrease in ocular pressure in its infinity clinical trial evaluating ADVM022 gene therapy for the treatment of diabetic macular edema. So this caught my eye because I'm an investor in a competing company called Regenix Bio. Both of these companies have a gene therapy version of an anti-VEGF treatment. So there's a lot of these anti-VEGF treatments that are on the market right now. A couple names are Ilea or Lucentis. And what these companies are doing at Verum, Regenix Bio, 4D molecular therapies, they're trying to make a gene therapy version that supersedes the need for monthly injections. So that's the normal regimen right now. And Adverum and Regenix Bio showed that with just one injection, they're able to improve the conditions of these patients by getting the native cells in the eye to express some kind of antibody or anti-VEGF molecule that will then prevent the blood vessel problem that goes on in the eye. So it's shown efficacy, which is good, but unfortunately there have been a lot of side effects associated with either the delivery mechanism or the gene therapy itself. So for more insight here, the event occurred 30 weeks after randomization in one patient treated with a single intravitreal injection of the high dose, 6 times 10 to the 11 vector genomes per eye, of ADVM022, who's developed hypotony with panuveitis and loss of vision in the treated eye. So it's not just the low ocular pressure, which could be a problem, but there's inflammation, which is the panuveitis, as well as blindness in the treated eye. So it's a big side effect that is kind of puzzling because when I looked into it, a couple things stuck out to me, which is that hypotony is relatively rare in general with any kind of injection in the eye. And the reason for this is when you're putting in fluid in the eye, the pressure actually increases. So rather than low ocular pressure, which is what is being seen here in this serious adverse reaction, 5 to 10% of either the treatment or the control group in the ILEA studies get an increase in intraocular pressure after 52 weeks. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that in general, there's an increase in inflammation and side effects associated with the gene therapy rather than the once monthly ILEA injection. So it seems like there's something going on with the actual gene therapy itself rather than the route of administration or the number of injections because ILEA is a once monthly injection and they have less side effects than say Adverum 022 or RGX314 when it's only one injection being given. So just to show that here, I pulled up some of the optic phase one data from Adverum and in the studies that had the high dose, which is six times 10 to the 11 vector genomes per eye, we're seeing here that in n equals 6 and n equals 9, there's around a 25 to 30 percent number of patients that still have some kind of ocular inflammation and have to manage it. And in this cohort 1, this is around an 86-week follow-up. So well over a year past the actual treatment date, they are still having inflammation that needs to be managed with steroid eye drops. So in the lower doses, this doesn't seem to be the case, but it is a concern that at these high doses, we're seeing so much inflammation. And the same is true with RGX314. So over one year after therapy, RGX314 leads to around 70% of patients with post-operative conjunctival hemorrhage, 36% of post-operative inflammation, eye irritation, eye pain, and post-operative visual acuity reduction in 17% of patients. Now, the RGX314 delivery means was subretinal, which is a much more invasive procedure than the intravitreal injection that Adverum has to give or ILEA. So what this says to me is that there's something else going on in the Adverum injection that is besides the route of injection, because intravitreal injections themselves are relatively low risk, and they're not usually causing a lot of problems. But we're still seeing these issues 
with Adverim despite that. So I think in general, it's going to be something that the gene therapy ophthalmology field has to work out. And I think for us in the short term, it's not going to be a big problem as long as there aren't these big, serious adverse events that Adverim has seen. So I have a number of shares in Regenix Bio, and I think it is it is a risk that there's going to be something serious that comes out, like what we've seen with Adverim, but I'm willing to take that risk. I think that the problems associated with the side effects are going to be a bigger issue for sort of the later Phase 3 or the BLA submission or the PDUFA date. And the reason for this is that if we can get by those hurdles through the early clinical trials, it's really going to be up to the launch before we need to really worry about whether or not patients are going to be comfortable taking, say, RGX314 versus ILEA. In the short term, we really just want to see that there's not going to be this absolute serious adverse event, which is totally possible, but I'm willing to take the risk. Regenix Bio is looking at improving their injection method going from subretinal to what's called supercroidal. And I'm going to share the catalyst in just a bit, but this year we actually have a number of readouts that's going to show whether or not the supercroidal injection method of RGX314 is able to lead to better or not efficacy in a number of different indications. So just to show what the side effects are for ILEA, I'm pulling this up from the label. And what we see here is that in ILEA or the control, there's really not much of a difference. Maybe a slight increase in cataract, but in general, this is probably the ideal that we want when it comes to our gene therapies. And if we can do this or better, I'd say we're looking good. Obviously, right now, the side effects are worse, but like I mentioned, I don't think it's a huge problem as long as there's no serious adverse event like what we've seen in Adverum. So that's going to be a risk to holding on to any of these companies that are trying to do something different in the eye. And I've mentioned 4D molecular therapeutics in the past. They might be able to overcome this with their directed evolution form of capsid. So we'll have to see when that data comes out. But in terms of the near-term catalysts, the ones that I'm most excited about are the supercroidal data readouts for wet AMD. And we're going to see interim data from cohort one expected in Q3 of 2021. And then in diabetic retinopathy, we're going to see initial data from their altitude study. And that's expected sometime this year. They do have a number of other gene therapies, but for me, I'm most interested in the RGX314 based ones. So that's Adverum. You don't like to see those kinds of side effects, but there are risks associated with trying to launch a new therapy. So it is what it is. And so I want to get to our main story for today. But before we do that, I want to thank our sponsor, which is a company called Gallant. And what they are doing is stem cell banking for pets. It is a patented technology that is able to isolate and store your pet's stem cells, and they're harvested during your pet's normal spay or neuter technique. Now, normally this tissue would just go to waste, but as we know, it's full of stem cells. And working with your veterinarian and gallant, you can preserve these tissues and isolate the stem cells so that in the future, when your pet starts to have regular diseases of aging, they could potentially be used to help out your pet. Stem cells have been used in hundreds of studies and have been shown to improve the quality of life of pets with everything from allergic skin conditions to orthopedic injuries and more. Plans start as low as $45 a month and you can check out more details at their website, gallant.com. You can also save $100 off the initial payments by using my coupon code BIO, that's B-I-O, and you can save $100 off your initial payments. Gallant.com, they're the stem cell banking company for pets, so check them out. All right, getting to the main story for today, I wanted to talk about Trillium Therapeutics. And they're trading today at a sub $1 billion market cap. And what they provided is updates on data. They announced phase 1b2 program priorities across hematologic malignancies and solid tumors, as well as reporting governance changes. So here's what the big takeaways were from the press release. TTI-622 monotherapy showed 33% objective response rate in relapsed refractory lymphomas between 0.8 to 18 mg per kg doses, including three new responses, one complete response and two partial responses. TTI-621 monotherapy showed an 18 to 29% ORR in relapsed refractory T and B cell lymphomas between 0.2 to 2 mg per kg doses. And here they showed another three new responders, one complete response and two partial responses. This is in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma since the last data disclosure. The company said that both TTI-622 and 621 have been well tolerated up to doses of 18 mg per kg and 2 mg per kg weekly. 
and neither drug candidate reached a maximally tolerated dose. They announced seven hematologic or solid tumor indications, and a bunch of people joined the board of directors or retired or joined the SAB. So this is the big announcement that we've been waiting for for about a quarter or two. And for me, what I was looking for here was the announcement of new indications, obviously, and they mentioned seven. And then the second one is they clarified a timeline on what they were going to focus on in the near term and how it was going to play out. So this is what I'm going to touch on in the next few slides, and we're going to talk about whether or not it's good, bad, and, and so forth. All right. So for the new indications, for those who don't know, and please check out my previous videos, I've looked at Trillium a few times now, and in my latest one on Trillium, I looked at them versus ALX Oncology, and since then I have taken a position in ALXO. So check those out, and I'm going to assume that you've looked at those, so I'm not going to go through all the background here. But for some background, TTI 621 and 622 were previously tested in CTCL, PTCL, and DLBCL. These are all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. And here they were able to see really nice monotherapy data, something that other CD47 targeted therapies have not been able to show. Now what Trillium has announced now is that new indications moving forward in hematologic cancers are gonna be multiple myeloma, acute myeloid leukemia, peripheral T-cell lymphoma, and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And in these studies, they're gonna be either in combination with other drugs or as a monotherapy. In solid tumors, they're gonna be looking at ovarian cancer, leiomyosarcoma, and a TBD. And you love a little suspense when it comes to corporate presentations, right? So this is the big announcement. And for more insight into the potential that these indications can lead to, what we really wanna know is the total addressable market. And what this gives us is an idea of really the potential that Trillium's molecule can reach if it were to be approved today. So in say multiple myeloma, what they're saying here is that the new addressable market in the US for fifth line or higher, which is what they'd be looking at, is around 8,000 patients. And what this allows us to do is multiply that by the potential wholesale acquisition cost to give us a potential maximum amount of revenue they could get for this indication. So you do that through all of the indications here and you can get a decent I'll say valuation of what the company is worth today. Those calculations are all hypothetical since no molecule really reaches 100% penetration into a market. So there has to be some discounting that goes on and we can use other drugs that have been approved in a similar indication to get an idea of that or assess new information that's come out in terms of say competition or whether or not there's a decrease in this potential market for us to get a better insight into how we should value the company. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide. You can read it yourself, but some things to note here is that TTI-622 is going to be the main molecule for multiple myeloma, AML in either P53 mutants or unfit patients, as well as ovarian cancer. They're also going to look at DLBCL with 622, as well as in 621. So they're using both molecules there to see which one is better. 621 is going to focus on PTCL as well as leiomyosarcoma. Now you'll also notice on this slide, they mentioned sort of expansion options with the proof of concept. And what this is to suggest to us is that if they're able to get positive data in the readout at the line they're looking at, whether that's fifth line or second line, there's potential if the data is good enough or if they're able to do another study with another combination for them to move up in line to then get a greater potential total addressable market. So in each one of these columns, they show that here. And one thing I'll note is that this is a valuable way to look at it. And I think in particular, the leiomyosarcoma indication is a strategic indication such that if they see positive data there, it will be pretty easy for them to do a small study in another kind of sarcoma subtype to then get approval for that with some kind of supplemental NDA submission or something like that. So. I think there are strategic decisions there, but today we kind of have to look at this on its face and use this as a, as a jumping off point for how we should value the company. So the strategy that they've chosen here, in my opinion, is that they chose indications that have a high likelihood of success or ones that were unlikely to have a competing CD47 molecule. And the reason for this is that it's a relatively competitive space right now 
there are a number of companies that have CD47 targeting assets that are moving a little bit faster than Trillium is. So while there are benefits to them going after these indications that are likely to succeed or don't have much competition, they're not the most exciting indications. And one example I'm going to use for this is a company called Karyofarm, and they have a molecule called Expovio, and it's approved for third line or higher multiple myeloma or fourth line and higher DLBCL. And as we know for Karyofarm, they have suffered pretty significantly in the market. And if we look at their sales here, now keep in mind, I know this isn't a perfect comparison, and 2020 was a COVID year, but we're looking at under $100 million dollar revenue for multiple myeloma because DLBCL in the earlier line multiple myeloma wasn't approved until December so really this first quarter data here is the first quarter where both the DLBCL indication and the multiple myeloma indication at this line were approved so you would expect a lot more growth from there but for the multiple myeloma indication that Trillium is looking at it's pretty much on par with what Expovio is seeing here. And I know the side effect profiles aren't the same, so I might be overly critical, but it's just not the most exciting indication to go after. Having said that, I do think that the AML indication is pretty exciting, and they're initiating trials for this in the second quarter of 2021. And I should mention that they have initiated their multiple myeloma trial as of this recording, so they're gonna generate data from that relatively soon. Now getting back to AML, I think AML is exciting for the reason that there's an opportunity for them to penetrate a market that doesn't have as much success as other AML indications do. And the reason for this is that there's a number of patients that have AML who are older who are unfit for the traditional therapy. So there's an opportunity there, and there's also an opportunity in patients that have a P53 mutation who don't respond well to the traditional standard of care. Now. Unfortunately for Trillium here, there are other companies looking at similar indications with CD47 assets. So I would say that AML is one indication that has a very high likelihood of success, but they do have competition here. So on the one hand though, Megrolimab, which is another CD47 targeting asset, has shown some proof of concept data that suggests that there's gonna be a very high likelihood that Trillium sees success here. And this is the data here, I'm not gonna focus on it too much, but suffice to say that since Megrolimab is seeing success, it's very likely that Trillium is also going to see success here. And if they're able to show better efficacy or a better safety profile, Trillium's molecule is likely to have a much better penetration of the market. Now, ALX148 is also looking at this indication, so it's something that Trillium's going to have to absolutely jump on and hurry up and get with the data. But I do think that the AML indication is probably the most exciting for the hematologic malignancies. And I think that they do have a chance to show better safety data in particular in comparison to Megrolimab, since we know that there is a thrombocytopenia problem with Megrolimab that Trillium is able to overcome uh, a little bit better. In solid tumors, Trillium is seeking indications in ovarian cancer as well as leiomyosarcoma. The combined total addressable market of these two indications at the target lines that Trillium is seeking is around 5,000 patients per year. Now, normally when you talk about solid tumors, investors get excited because usually it represents a much larger patient population than a hematologic malignancy. I would say in general, hematologic malignancies are more crowded with molecules than solid tumors in general. So it's for that reason that I was excited that Trillium was going to start to get into solid tumors was that they were going to pick ones that had a pretty big total addressable market that was going to substantially increase the potential for the molecule. Now they're choosing these indications at these target lines for the reasons I outlined before for strategic purposes. It's going to be easier for them to get successful data in these later lines and there's going to be potential once they get that proof of concept data to move into earlier lines if they show that first initial positive data. They'll also have kind of a green light to move ahead in those earlier lines with combination therapies that could then also open up the market as well. So I understand why they're doing it, but because they've chosen these relatively smaller indications in solid tumors, we kind of have to take it on its face and really only consider it as another 5,000 potential patients being added to the total addressable market. The other thing that I wasn't super thrilled about was that the details for the ovarian cancer study were not coming until the second half of 2021. 
For leiomyosarcoma, they mentioned they're not going to initiate the study until Q3 of 2021. And if we extrapolate from that, we're really not going to see any data readouts from these indications until well into 2022. And as I've mentioned before, time in preclinical biotech companies is money. And the longer they take to generate data, the less investors are impressed and have confidence that the company is going to be able to deliver. So I wasn't super excited about these timelines. And unfortunately, the total addressable market of 5,000 patients just doesn't get a lot of people excited. Having said that, I do think that there's potential here. And if they are able to deliver in this, there is going to be a lot of upside for the company. But today, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of excitement around their solid tumor program. The other thing is the fact that they left this TBD indication off of their announcement. I would have really liked them to have a secure plan and to be executing on it already. Indications in solid tumors are a big driver for investors, and I would have expected them to really hit home hard the focus the company was going to have on solid tumors. All right, so those are my takes on the indications that they're going into. And I then wanted to touch on the timeline. So the company's already started their multiple myeloma study. They're going to initiate their AML studies in Q2 of this year. And then in the second half of 2021, they're going to provide data updates on lymphomas. They're going to provide the trial design on the ovarian cancer study. In Q4, they're going to initiate the PD-1 combination with DLBCL. In 2022, they're then going to provide an additional solid tumor study information, but when we're getting into 2022, it's hard to really have too much excitement over that. For 621 and Q3, they're going to start the leiomyosarcoma study. They're also going to start the monotherapy in PTCL, as well as initiate the DLBCL study. So after going through the timeline here, you can see that there's not really a lot in the way of catalysts between now and the end of the year. They say here to expect data flow with multiple potential catalysts in Q4 2021 and 2022. And so they're leaving it relatively vague. And the reason for that is we need to see very quick enrollment in the AML and multiple myeloma trials in order for us to hit, say, Q4 2021 for an actual data readout. If they're not able to enroll quick enough, we're really looking at 2022 before we can see any data from any of these studies. And for me, this is kind of a miss. I'm looking for reasons to want to hold the stock, but because the catalysts are so scarce between now and then, I'm struggling quite a bit with reasons to hold on to the position that I have already. So here's my overall conclusion from the R&D day from Trillium. Basically, CD47 is an extremely crowded space. Gilead and ALX Oncology are probably the biggest competition right now for Trillium's molecules, and these two companies are moving fast. They are not sitting around thinking about indications. ALXO has big readouts coming up. Gilead is looking in hematologic malignancies, and they've shown good data already in these more focused indications. So Trillium's success is absolutely going to depend on delivering positive readouts in a timely manner. I would have liked to see this R&D date earlier in the year, and I hate to say it, but most of H1 of 2020 has had no progress in terms of new indications. Yes, they've initiated AML and they've initiated multiple myeloma, but in H2 of 2020, I don't know why they weren't having these conversations already, so they could have started these trials maybe in the later half of 2020 or early 2021, rather than waiting until mid Q2 of 2021 before starting. And they're also not gonna be starting their solid tumor trials until the second half of the year. And I really think that that is a disappointment from my standpoint. Their chosen indications are kind of competitive. I'm excited about AML, but it's going to be competitive with Gilead as well as ALXO, like I mentioned. I also touched on the relatively small total addressable market, and I understand the strategic reasons for doing it, but I do think today it's going to put a damper on the stock price. Now, on the bright side, Pfizer took a $25 million investment in Trillium, including an equity purchase at $10.88 per share. The stock is trading below that right now, and I see that as kind of an opportunity. Another thing to note is that there's significant amount of options activity on the May 21st expiration contract of the $12.50 call. The open interest on this contract is enormous, and as far as I can see, there's no catalyst between now and May 21st. 
so it seems a little strange. Some of the digging that I did, and some people noted on Twitter that the ASCO abstracts are going to be released on May 19th, but as far as I know, Trillium hasn't submitted an abstract. I did find that Magrolimab is going to be on an abstract on uh, the MDS indication as well as azacitidine, and this is suggestive of AML even though Trillium isn't looking in MDS. It might have some kind of suggestive nature on the way that AML is going to work out for Trillium, but I think that is kind of a reach. I did notice that the ESMO abstract deadline is May 14th, so maybe Trillium's going to submit an abstract there and give us some kind of press release, but I still think that that's a stretch given that notifications on the acceptance of the abstract isn't going to happen until July 20th. So it's absolutely strange that this kind of options activity is going on. And for me, I'm going to hold on to the stock kind of reluctantly for the reasons that I outlined here. And what I really want to ask the community is tell me where I'm wrong. I would love to hear a really compelling reason why I should hold on to Trillium between now and the end of 2021, because I think that barring some kind of buyout, I think the company is likely to hover around $10 a share until the end of the year when we can get closer to those data readouts and potentially see some exciting news from the company. So that's my overall take on Trillium, and I wanted to quickly compare the readouts to ALX Oncology. I did mention that I have a position in the company, and I think that they have potential, like Trillium does, to really make a mark in hematologic as well as solid cancers. And here's what we're going to expect in the year. In mid-2021, they're going to present full results of their Phase 1b trial in gastric cancer. They're seeking second line here, and the total addressable market is 13,000 patients. In the second half of this year, they're also going to be showing results in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, and this is in second line, and the total addressable market here is another 13,000 patients. In Q4 of this year, they're going to present data on MDS, and in general, they're looking at relapsed and refractory as well as treatment-naive patients, so the total addressable market is around 10,000 patients, and that, that figure might be questionable, um, but that's, I think, a fair and reasonable estimate of the patients. So just with these three indications alone, ALX Oncology is going to be showing us data for a total addressable market of around 36,000 patients. Now, this is more than the sum of all of the indications that Trillium is looking at in terms of total addressable market, and they're just getting around to initiating those studies. And the reason for me showing this is that time is very valuable here, and I would love it if Trillium could get excited and get moving. ALXO is also going to be initiating trials in AML, gastric cancer, MDS, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, as well as HER2 positive breast cancer in the second half of this year. So those are all things to watch for as well, even though they're not very exciting. All right. So in terms of upcoming catalysts, we saw the Cardiff catalyst that didn't do too much, so I sold that. Trillium R&D came and went. Acadia got their PDUFA and they did receive a CRL. The issue is that the stock dropped to around 20 bucks a share. I'm still holding on to that. And we should be hearing from their Q1 earnings report some update in terms of whether or not they filed for a type A meeting with the FDA to figure out their, their steps forward. So I think that is going to be a bullish catalyst if they do get that meeting. And I'm going to look to exit the position somewhere around then. Anovis has more catalysts coming up for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in May. I'm going to add more to that position probably this week. SIO Gene Therapies has a presentation at ASGCT. Somebody in the Discord channel brought this up to me. But on May 13th, they're going to present updates in their Parkinson's data study. And this is a gene therapy where they looked at only four or five patients, but we only saw data from two patients later last year. And so they might give us updates on three patients, which would be huge, especially if the data is positive. So I think that catalyst could be a big mover for SIOX. Atrika has data coming in Q2 at some point, same with Hepion. And then Oncternal has updates in mid-2021, as well as ALX Oncology for their gastric cancer. To give a quick portfolio wrap-up, I am looking at negative 11% for the year as of the end of April. I This data is old as of last Friday, so it's probably even worse than that after um, the, the latest drops we've seen in the market. The whole XBI is, is hurting quite a bit right now, and you know we're hoping to see some good data turn it around, but we saw a lot of 
articles come out about drug pricing from the government that has gotten in the way, as well as the FTC's lawsuit against Illumina for their acquisition. And I think this is kind of hindering the hopes of a lot of M&A activity in the sector. So we'll see, but I'm still holding on to the positions that I've discussed previously. And like I mentioned here, I sold the Cardiff position I had, and I'm likely going to increase my Anovis position, which is right here. So I think they're probably going to pop up on uh, some news, some positive Alzheimer's news. Compared to other indices, I'm losing to ARCG as well as the XBI. The IBB, NASDAQ, S&P 500, as well as the Dow Jones are all doing quite a bit better than me. And that's how it's going right now. But we're going to look to have a good rest of the Q2 and the rest of 2021. And with that, I'm going to wrap up the show. But I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Hit the like or subscribe button and let me know what you think. This is my honest take on the Trillium R&D day. I know there's a lot of people that love Trillium and I like Trillium too, but I thought the R&D day left more to be desired. But I'm still excited about the company and I hope that they are able to deliver on the timelines they set out today. So with that, we're going to wrap up. But thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time.